Welcome to today's discussion of college pricing and access more broadly. I'm Kristen Butcher. I'm the director of the Center on Children and Families at Brookings Institution. And uh, I'm also the mother of college and teenage children. And so I'd like to say a happy belated Mother's Day to all who celebrate. Uh, for all the parents out there, I think it's safe to say that making decisions about education for one's children is right up there among some of the very scariest, scariest decisions one has to make as a parent. And it isn't just about individual choices because choosing the right investments in human capital from a societal perspective feeds critically into labor market outcomes and economic growth. So this is a scary decision, both as parents and as members of the society, and we all have some skin in this game. So I'm delighted to have today's panel to tackle some of these thorny questions of college financing and access. So first, let me introduce Phil Levine, who is the Catherine Coleman and A. Barton Hepburn Professor of Economics at Wellesley College, my beloved alma mater, and a non-resident fellow at Brookings, and the CEO of myintuition.org, which is a nonprofit that gives low cost, low, um, like very quick cost estimates of college. Um, and most importantly for today, he's the author of the new book, A Problem of Fit, How the Complexity of College Pricing Hurts Students and University. He's gonna kick us off by talking about his new book for about 30 minutes, and then we'll turn to our panelists for a discussion of the book and related themes. If you have questions during this time, you can send them to us at events at brookings.edu or on Twitter using the hashtag problem of fit all squished together as one word. When we switch over to the panel, I'm delighted to say that we have uh, three uh, really all stars to discuss these issues. Uh, the first person will be Joyce St. John. Uh, she is Dean of Admission and Financial Aid at Wellesley College. And as of June 1st, she's the Director of Admissions at Harvard University. Next, we'll have Lindsay Page, who's the Annenberg Associate Professor of Education Policy at Brown University. And her work focuses on um, policy efforts to improve college access and success, especially for students who would be the first in their family to reach post-secondary education. And finally, we have Sandy Baum, who's a non-resident senior fellow in the Center on Education Data and Policy at the Urban Institute, and a former professor of economics at Skidmore College. Um, she is co-author of the forthcoming book, forthcoming next week, Can College Level the Playing Field, Higher Education in an Unequal Society? And with that, Phil, why don't you talk to us about your book for about 30 minutes? Okay, uh, there we go. So I think that we are now all set with the uh, screen share. So let's get started. Um, yeah, so this is my book, A Problem of Fit. I'd like to spend some time talking about it. Uh, you know, I think that, you know, we start off as a society thinking about uh, social mobility and the American dream as, you know, these are good things. These are things that we all, you know, hope for uh, and would like our society to be able to accomplish. Uh, one way in which that can happen is through higher education. Sometimes people refer to higher education as the engine of social mobility. It has the potential to take people, uh, to raise people up the economic ladder from, from where they're starting, um, you know, from where they're starting. So the thing is, though, is, it, you know, it doesn't seem like we do a great job of accomplishing that goal, at least to the extent that we would like. Um, one way that you can see that is because there are so many organizations out there whose goal is to promote college access. Uh, and so clearly there is a need for, for, for that, those sorts of services. You know, I have just a listing of a hand few of them here, um, but there's you know, considerably more than this. All are working towards the same end of improving college access so that the goal of social mobility can be met for those students. Uh, so in my book, I talk about this and label it as a problem of fit. So what does that mean? I think that, uh, we, you know, if, if we can take a step back and think about what's the goal of the system that we're looking for. And, I, you know, I think the right idea is that what we want to happen is for every student, regardless of their academic ability, that they end up in the place that's the good fit for them. Uh, that does not mean, by the way, that everyone should go to college. It's perfectly appropriate for some 
uh, for some individuals to, you know, pick up a trade or whatever. College is not the right answer for everybody. But for those uh, for whom it is the right answer, they should go to the right place. Not everyone is meant to go to Harvard, but for the ones who are intended to go to Harvard, they should go. And uh, for some, there are individuals, you know, a four-year public institution might be the perfect fit for them. Um, for others, a community college, whatever, wherever they're going to do the best, where they are going to thrive, that's where they should go. A problem of fit just means that if that's not happening, that's a problem. Uh, and we think that that doesn't happen. And there's definitely, you know, certainly evidence that supports the fact that that doesn't happen. So the question then becomes, why? You know, what are the sort of the structural constraints in the system that reduce the ability for individuals to, you know, achieve that fit? Uh, you know, there's a number of factors. Uh, you know, inequities in the K through 12 education system. Sandy, uh, Sandy's book is all about that. I'm, I'm assuming she'll be talking about that a little bit later on. Um, you know, if you're first generation, if you're a first generation college student, understanding what your options are is pretty complicated. Um, there's other barriers in the process, test taking, applications. You know, we can go on and there's, there's a whole host of hurdles that students need to, to get over uh, to make it through the college going system. Uh, what I want to focus on in my book and in this talk is pricing. Uh, so the issue is, is that the pricing system is incredibly complex and there's issues about whether it's affordable, even if you do understand the price. So, you know, we need to think about those sorts of things and whether, you know, pricing is helping us accomplish or not accomplish the goal of fit. Um, you know, I think that that's an important aspect to look at because I would argue that it's probably, it's the first hurdle that you have to get over. All of there's, you know, this series of hurdles that you need to go through, but if you can't accomplish the goal of convincing yourself that college is affordable and that it actually is affordable for you, you can't go. Uh, and then you can't accomplish this, this uh, you know, uh, attending the right fit institution. That, you know, getting over the hurdle of pricing is one that needs to be built into the system to enable us to accomplish the social mobility we're looking for. So what is it that I do in the book? Uh, I sort of have three main tasks. The first is to document the problems. Um, you know, the first problem in, uh, that is pervasive in our higher education system is the focus on the sticker price. The sticker price is really not a great gauge of what college is going to cost people. Uh, why that matters is because people don't understand that and they think that it is what they will have to pay. Uh, and college actually costs much less than many people uh, anticipate. Uh, despite the fact that it likely costs less, it's also probably the case that for some students and particularly, particularly low-income students, it still costs too much. Uh, so we want to document that. The questions then become why? So, you know, why is this system set up in a way that doesn't seem like it really accomplishes all of its goals? Uh, and here's where I think, you know, a little bit of economic analysis can go a long way. Um, uh, you know, using methods of economics that I teach in my introduct introduction to microeconomics class here at Wellesley College can get us really a long way towards thinking about what's going on in the system and recognizing that there's institutional constraints that, that uh, schools face that make it difficult for them to do what we would all love to see them uh, be able to do. And then at the end of the talk, uh, I'll spend some time uh, talking about potential solutions. Um, in terms of complexity, I'll talk about this thing called the financial aid information funnel. At the moment, that won't mean much to you, uh, but I promise I'll explain it a little bit later. And then uh, something that probably is a little bit more transparent is to double the size of the Pell Grant. So that is um, sort of what I want to cover today. So to be able to get through all of this material, I think it's important that we at least have some baseline framework for thinking about how the financial aid system works. Uh, if you don't understand those basic details, it's gonna be hard to understand what I'm gonna talk about later. So I just wanna spend a few minutes talking about that. Um, here is a nice slide characterizing the financial aid system that I found you know, through our friend Google. Uh, and I love this because it's labeled the college financial aid process in the senior year, the high level overview. 
So apparently this is what it takes to, to you know, if this is, if this is the 30,000 foot view, uh, imagine what it's like when you're down on the ground. Um, I could spend the next hour talking about this slide, but I think we probably need to go a little bit higher than this. And I wanna simplify the system down to three simple steps. Uh, there's basically three things we care about in the system. There's the income and assets of the student and their families, students and their families um, that form the basis of a financial aid uh, calculation. Uh, you need to know those things. You, you, you insert a whole bunch of income and asset data into these fancy formulas, which are known as FAFSA and the CSS profile. Uh, they spit out something called an EFC, an expected family contribution. Uh, you'll notice that I have that in parentheses labeled afford with quotation, quotation marks around it, because in theory, what the expected family contribution is supposed to be providing is an estimate of how much the family can afford. In the financial aid world, that is a controversial, uh, how you do that obviously is controversial because figuring out how much a family can afford is obviously difficult. Um, nevertheless, that is exactly how it is used in the system as, a, as an uh, estimate of what people can afford to pay. <clears throat> we go from that estimate of the EFC to this next level concept called the net price. The net price really is how much you have to pay in total. So the net price includes um, uh, all the elements of the financial aid package, it includes the direct student and parent contribution, the payment that the students and parents makes themselves, make themselves, that would be in, you know, in the form of, you know, in the vernacular cash, writing a check, whatever. That is the direct payment that goes to the institution. Um, it also includes student loans. It also includes work study. All of those things go into what we would label as the net price. It's Definitely more common to hear the net price labeled as the sticker price minus the grant aid, all of the expenses that you need to pay to attend the institution. What I described as the net price uh, and the typical usage of net price is sticker price minus grant aid, they are equivalent, mathematically equivalent. So again, you take the cash payment, you add the student loan, you add the work study, that's the net price. Uh, only at meet full need institutions is the cash payment that you need to make equal to your EFC. Uh, if you're at or enrolling or attending a meet full need institution, the cash payment that you pay is the EFC. It's the amount that you can afford, quote unquote. Um, and then you go from there and you can add student loans and work study. At any other institution, that's like 60 or 70 institutions in the country out of the hundreds or thousands that exist. Uh, at most other institutions, uh, students do not pay their EFC as their cash payment. They pay more than that. There's something that's called a gap between the two. Okay. Um, so that's the background. Uh, the next question I want to ask is, so what does college really cost? And it turns out that we have a lot of misunderstandings as individuals, as students, as parents, and as society more broadly about what college really costs. Uh, here is a list of media reports that focus on the rising costs of college. So here's one. Colleges have already begun to price themselves out of the American dream. Access to higher education, a hallmark of an open society, is being threatened by rising college costs. The rising costs and limited grants are narrowing higher education's ability to serve as a bridge leading low income and particularly minority youngsters into the middle class. If we go on this way for another 25 years, we won't have an affordable system of higher education. I'm pretty sure that all of you have seen quotes essentially exactly like this uh, in media. It's extremely common to hear people talk about higher education and the cost of higher education in this way. Well, here's the thing. This last one came from the New York Times in 2016. Going up the slide, the one before that was from the New York Times in 2001. The one before that in 1987. And the one before that in 1973. Clearly, there has to be something wrong in the way that we're thinking about college costs. If for 50 years, we've been talking about the system collapsing under the rising prices, and it seem, seemingly hasn't. 
uh, we, you know, we continue to make exactly the same arguments uh, and they don't seem to be coming true. So why is that? And so this is from uh, an opinion piece that I wrote in the Carter Chronicle of Higher Education a couple months ago, talking about this exact issue. And it's because of the focus on the sticker price. All we ever do is we focus on the sticker price. You know, on the Wellesley College, we, we charge quote unquote $80,000 and people think that $80,000 is the magic number. That's true at many other um, uh, private colleges and universities. Public institutions charge $30,000. That's a lot too. Those are sticker prices. Most people don't pay those prices. Uh, so here's my statistic, you know, over 85% of freshmen attending four year residential colleges receive some, some form of financial aid. That means 15% of students, less than fewer, fewer than 15% of the students are paying those numbers that are rising so dramatically. The only people who are paying those rapidly rising prices are high income students, not everybody else. So why does that matter? Well, it affects our perception for what college costs. So what do families think, what, what do families think about, uh, about college costs? Well, if you ask them, they will tell you, and the numbers that they will tell you are too high. So, uh, at four years, what's interesting about this is we, you know, we can compare how this has changed over time. So, I have here overestimates of college costs and survey data. If we ask people what do they think, how much do they think it's going to cost to send their kids to school, to college, you know, at four-year public institutions, they all they overestimate by almost double, on average, consistently over the last you know, 20 or so years. At four-year private institutions, which granted are starting from a higher sticker price in the first place, which would dampen the, uh, the overestimate by, by some, they're overestimating by about 50%. Uh, so the numbers that people have in their heads about what college is gonna cost their kids is a lot more than what it actually will cost them. Um, if you ask you know, high school seniors what they think about college costs, about half of them really only know the sticker price. The sticker price is the magic number that they think they're going to have to pay, except for the fact that most of them are not going to have to pay them. And that's an indication where the complexity of the system is just really hurting kids. Um, to the extent that they think college is expensive, whether, you know, how expensive it is, I will address in a few minutes, but certainly they think it costs much more than it actually does cost. And that can certainly limit access. So that raises the question, well, how much does it really cost and can families afford the amount that, that institutions charge them? Uh, so let me spend a few minutes talking about how we wanna think about this problem. Uh, so what I have over here on the right is this nice little graph that relates how much families can afford the EFC relative to how much they're going to have to pay the net price. And clearly there's going to be some upward sloping relationship between those two things which is gonna be, I mean, that's basically, this is what the financial aid system does. It's capped at the, pro, at the top by the sticker price. So I just made the argument that the sticker price is not the right number for most people to be thinking about. It's very common for people to move, when they wanna move off of the sticker price to start talking about average net prices. So the average net price is gonna be some number in the middle of this relationship. That's great if you're average, most people aren't average. So, you know, in some sense, what we want to know about is, you know, for you as a student or as a family, what is college going to cost you? That's something which I refer to as an individual net price. What will college cost you? That's what we want to know. So for different people at different places in this, you know, affordability spectrum, what will college cost you? So I want to get, move on towards thinking about addressing that issue for people at different levels. Sorry, of could you say that again? Sorry. <laughs> Sorry about that. My Apple watch is going crazy here. <laughs> um, so what we want to know about is for different, for people at different levels of the income and asset distribution, what do colleges charge them? That's the goal of this next exercise. And can they afford that? So what, I'm gonna, what am I going to do to accomplish that goal? Um, I'm going to make extensive use of these things called net price calculators. Net price calculators were required by federal law in 2008, went into effect nationwide at every institution beginning in 2011. Um, and if you insert a lot of characteristics about yourself, they will spit out 
an estimate about what college will cost you at a particular institution for your particular finances. Um, they are not typically easy to work with. There's a lot of limitations of net price calculators. Uh, I hired a student to do this for me. Uh, I don't think that they were happy <laughs> going through this uh, exercise 200 times, which is uh, what I had them do. Actually, a thousand times because for five types of students. And you can see the types of students that I used over here on the right. I used people at the 10th, 25th, 50th, 75th, and 90, 90th percentiles of the income and asset distributions. I didn't want to provide all the details, but here's the, the, the levels of income that's appropriate for those students. And I applied to each of these students and families uh, a, a, an asset level that's sort of commensurate with you know, where they are in the distribution. So for the 200 schools that I had uh, uh, my student conduct this exercise for, there's 50 in four different categories of institutions. Private institutions with large endowments, I have that in quotes because we think about you know, Harvard and Stanford and Princeton as those institutions. They're in that group, but so is Wabash College, uh, which has an $800 uh, million dollar endowment for 400 students. Um, so it's you know, a little bit more of a diverse group of schools than you might otherwise have anticipated. Um, other private institutions, if they don't have a large endowment, they're in the other private institution category. I distinguish public institutions by public flagships and R1s. Uh, the second R1 institutions are heavy research uh, institutions that aren't public flagships. So for instance, in UCLA, in, in California, Berkeley is the flagship. UCLA is you know, clearly a, a, a lead institution as well, but it's not the flagship, they're included. Uh, and then the, the fourth category is other four-year public institutions. So what are we looking for? So what this picture is designed to do is to provide a baseline for sort of how to evaluate the results. So, so this is the, an example of an institution that meets full need. So what I've done here, each of these dots are people at different percentiles of the income and asset distribution. So for instance, if you're at the 10th or really the 25th percentile of the income or asset distribution, the amount that you're expected to be able to pay essentially is zero. Um, but that would be just the cash component. So on top of that, remember, we're going to add on loans and work study. Different institutions have different loan and work study policies. I'm going to essentially assert the most common ones, which would be a $5,500 student loan and $2,500 in work study. Those are common values that institutions use. So even if you're not paying anything directly in cash, that's still about $8,000 in loans and, and work study that you would pay, that would be your net price. At that point, basically, this line is going up for dollar for dollar for every additional dollar in EFC, for every additional dollar you can afford to pay, your net price goes up by a dollar. That's the way it would work at a meet full need institution with these loan and work study policies, okay? So basically what we wanna do next is compare what these profiles look like at these different categories of institutions um, to this line. This is what things look like at a high endowment private institution. You'll notice that um, at the lower income levels, at the 10th, 25th, and 50th percentiles, there's you know, slight deviations between this meet full need, this magical meet full need line, uh, this baseline meet full need line and what the students are paying. You know, there's maybe a little bit of a gap there. It's not very big. For all practical purposes, essentially, they're paying what they can afford. Uh, when we get up beyond that, they tend to, it turns out even at these institutions, they're, they're paying a little bit less than they can afford. This would not be true at, a, at, a specific, at an actual meet full need institution. So like my institution in Wellesley College, the students would be really right on this line. Um, but some of the schools in this category offer merit awards and it's the merit awards that would, bring the, that would typically bring them down. Um, so some of those are factored in as well here in this category. It's when we get to the public flagships that we start to see a problem. So at public flagships, where you can see that, you know, at the end, you can see there's the capping of the tuition by the sticker price of roughly $30,000, uh, which means that for these students, they're paying less than they can afford. But that also means at the lower end, that's not what's happening. At the lower end, there's significant gaps about what students are actually asked to pay relative to what they can afford to pay. 
inc including both the loan and the work study, con expected loan and work study contribution. These gaps are on the order of you know, roughly $5,000. This is a family that can't afford to pay anything in cash, including an $8,000 loan and work study expectation. They still have to come up with an additional $5,000. That go, that's through almost, you know, roughly half of students face that problem. Same thing is true at other public institutions. The numbers are not really all that much different, very similar. At other private institutions, the problem is even worse. So at other private institutions, uh, you know, these are gaps of on the order of $10,000 a year. It's, these are very large gaps of affordability that students face at those institutions. So that, and then, so here's the summary slide. So basically, you know, at, at uh, uh, private institutions, they seem like they're doing okay at the lower end. Public institutions are definitely struggling. There's a sizable gap and the gap gets even larger at other public, public uh, private institutions. So that raises the question, why? And this is where a little bit of economics comes into play. Now, it's very common in an economics class to talk about uh, competition and how competition is a good thing. Um, in general, competition is a good thing because uh, it generates the lowest possible price for consumers. And when firms, when the market deviates for, from perfect competition and firms have something called market power, which would be, you know, if you're thinking about Verizon and AT&T, they have market power. Then we would argue that they, ch they charge, those types of, of organizations charge too much. Sometimes people use that um, to argue that uh, we need more competition in higher education as well. The problem is, is that higher education is different. And in the higher education marketplace, students don't all pay the same price. Pretty much everybody pays a different price. We just discussed that. Um, this is not a lot different than airline pricing. I think it's common for people to think about airlines as everybody's paying a different price. The same thing is true at college. Um, where that matters, is that higher income students who pay more have the ability to subsidize lower income students who pay less. In a for-profit sector, the higher income students paying more would be profit, but that's not how it works in the nonprofit sector. In the nonprofit sector, those higher income students paying more would subsidize the lower income students and that provides more money for financial aid. The more market power firms have, the more market power higher educational institutions have, the greater ability to do this. Um, that certainly is true at elite, uh, highly endowed private institutions. You know, Harvard can charge a lot. People are willing to pay it. That money can be used to subsidize lower income students. Those institutions also have the uh, advantage of very large endowments, which can help subsidize lower income students as well. At those institutions, the system works pretty well. Uh, it's just that there's not very many of those institutions. At public institutions, they there's sort of a dual problem. And the first side of the problem is that uh, higher income students are capped for how much they can pay by a price ceiling. Um, in some sense, the purpose of imposing that price ceiling is to make college affordable. Uh, it's just that what we're doing there is making college affordable for higher income students. That reduces revenue for the institution. It reduces their ability to use the additional revenue to subsidize lower income students that money isn't there. Uh, we can get around that problem if those institutions, if the states also pro provided sufficient direct support to the institutions so that they can use that money to provide greater uh, uh, amounts of financial aid. You know, those direct states, the direct state support also seems to be insufficient. Uh, at the end, you have lower prices for higher income students and a world in which the lower income students really can't afford to pay the tuition. Uh, other private institutions, the, one that are, the ones that are less well endowed, you know, they're, sort of, they're really sort of caught in the middle of this problem. They don't have the market power to charge higher income students more. The way they get around that is they tend to charge sticker prices that are relatively high, um, but the, ver the large majority, if not all of the students at those institutions then receive large merit aid awards. So that sticker price is you know, relevant for virtually nobody at those institutions. Uh, because they have to compete with public institutions. They also don't have large endowments or direct state support to fill in the gaps for lower income students. And that's why they struggle the most to provide sufficient financial aid 
for those students. So where does that leave us in terms of public policy? <clears throat> public policy, how do we fix these problems? So, you know, the first part of the problem that I alluded to or, or just described was uh, one of information gaps. People think college is much more expensive than it actually is. Um, the solution that I like to promote uh, to address this problem is something which I'm going to call a financial aid, inform financial aid information funnel. So what do I mean by that? In some sense, in higher education, funnels are things that we're used to talking about all the time. Certainly everybody in the admissions office knows very well what the funnel looks like. Uh, the goal of the admissions process is to recruit um, potentially interested students early on in their high school careers, uh, convert them into prospects, and get, make that prospect pool as large as you possibly can. Uh, the admissions process is one where you narrow down from prospects to applicants to admitted students until ones that you initially enroll. Um, that's just the way the system works. There's a funnel. Everybody acknowledges that there's a funnel. That's, it, the system is designed to, to accomplish that goal. Uh, I wanna introduce the concept of a financial aid information funnel as doing a similar sort of thing. Start from students at a very, very early stage of the process, provide them with the information that they need just to recognize that the $80,000 and the $30,000 is not the amount they are going to have to pay. You provide what I'm calling an income only estimate. Provide like I make $60,000 a year. What can I expect roughly to think, is college going to cost me $80,000? No. Is it going to cost me you know, $10,000? Maybe, but something more like that. Uh, get, get people off of the sticker price. The sticker price is the enemy here because most people don't pay that. Along the way, is that, that just keeps them moving through the system. You know, take a ninth or a 10th grader and convince them that maybe college is affordable for them. As they move through the system and as they move into high, the higher grades, they're gonna wanna know a more precise estimate because at some point that will matter. Provide more information, maybe some initial uh, asset data, basic stuff. Um, you know, do you own your own house for if you're in, for institutions that require home equity calculations? Uh, do you have money in stocks and bonds? Provide basic stuff. You know, do we really need to know about the overseas assets and the you know the self-employment uh, assets of the household? Like those can come later. Eventually, you fill out the FAFSA or the CSS profile that will give you an EFC. The EFC, as we just discussed, still doesn't tell you what college is going to cost. Eventually, you get a final financial aid award, but narrow, narrow, narrow until the very end of the process. Introduce a funnel for financial aid the same way we do for admissions. That can help address the complexity issues. But what do we do about the affordability issues? Because we know those are still there too. Uh, the solution that I prefer is uh, doubling the Pell Grant. So how does that work? So, and why would that be successful? That $5,000 gap, roughly, that we saw for lower income students is almost exactly the amount that you would get from doubling the Pell Grant. And so those calculations were done three or four years ago when the Pell Grant was like a roughly that amount. Um, it provides for the students who face the most significant problems of affordability an amount to cover the exact size of the gap that they face. Um, it's the right amount of money for the right people for the right students. Uh, a concern that sometimes you hear people raise is that institutions will just undo the, uh, an increase in the Pell Grant by raising their tuition. That isn't exactly what we see in terms of the evidence uh, uh, based on past Pell Grant increases. But even if you were worried about, uh, about that, you know, I think that we can, we, there's ways around that. So you know, suppose you were to offer institutions the deal that we will double the Pell Grant if you agree to meet full need for those students they should be willing to accept that deal because they, you are giving them enough money to meet the full need. And if they agree to that contract, essentially, they will accept the money, provide, pass that along on to students because they would have to, uh, and they wouldn't have the opportunity to raise tuition to, to, to you know, usurp those funds. Um, so I think that that is a problem that can be overcome. So at that point, I think I'm right at my 30 minute limit <laughs> and I will turn the floor over. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. All right, 
Thank you very much for that, Phil. Um, we're going to turn to our panelists to get a view from the ground. So just to recap a little bit, here we have this really complicated system where uh, it's a mix of public and private funds. There are different types of institutions competing over the same pool of students. And then we have this vast lack of information that uh, intersects nicely with the complexity, right? I'm sure we have all seen some TV show where you have a low income kid who is brilliant and there's a sad scene where it's, you know, it would be nice if this person could go to Harvard, but too bad it costs a billion dollars, right? That's just wrong. And <laughs> I will preempt the ending and say, if you are brilliant, you should apply to good schools and there will be a way to, uh, to afford it. Um, so with that, let's turn it over to our panelists, uh, Joy St. John, who is the Dean of Admission and Financial Aid at Wellesley College and soon to be the Director of Admissions at Harvard University is gonna kick us off. So go ahead, Joy. Thank you, uh, Kristen, for having me. I feel honored to be on this panel with um, Sandy and Lindsay. Um, feeling a little imposter syndrome, but let me share my um, observations. I, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, some of my observations um, that I, in terms of what I've seen in my own career that have um, driven this pricing, college pricing information gap. Uh, within our industry of admission and financial aid. And I should say, um, so I've worked in college admission um, and financial aid for 25 years. When I moved to Harvard in June, that will be my sixth um, college or university at which I've worked. And I have really covered a range of institutions. My first job was at a small regional university with a very small endowment and that was entirely uh, tuition revenue driven. And obviously um, in moving to Harvard, it's the opposite of that in terms of financing. But I think that perspective and then it's and then time and, and things that have changed over time. And so I just wanna share um, that my perspective from kind of the practitioner point of view in terms of how we got here and perhaps, um, you know, what I think our future will hold or has to hold. Um, so the first thing I want to just address, and again, I am not talking about this from a um, sophisticated uh, needs analysis, public policy perspective, but really from a practitioner's perspective in terms of what I've seen in the business. And I think the first question I want to address is sort of, um, where does the challenge um, come from in clarifying pricing um, from our perspective and what we've seen over time? Uh, and one of the things I have first have to say is actually comes from a very, I think, positive place, particularly from um, the financial aid side of the house, in that financial aid administrators are really driven by a desire to try and apply needs analysis in as equitable a way as possible between similarly situated families. And you will hear them talk about that frequently with families and when they talk in general about financial aid. Um, but depending on the type of institution in which you work, you're also driven as a financial aid uh, professional uh, by using aid as a way to help the college meet its enrollment goals. It is a tool, an important lever in enrolling the types of students that the college has identified it wants to enroll. And um, financial aid as a budget driver is tremendous, right? And so financial aid uh, professionals feel a tremendous responsibility to the college or the university to manage the aid budget um, to, to um, as a major factor in building and spending a college's operating budget, especially for tuition driven um, institutions. But even aid directors at um, institutions that don't gap students have, you know, have, have large endowments are able not to gap students meet 100% of demonstrated need. Even those aid directors um, at, at what we might um, historically re refer to as need blind meet 100% of demonstrated need institutions, even they experience pressure um, regarding the portion of the operating budget that needs to be dedicated to aid each year. Um, because um, at those institutions, it can be difficult to predict 
how much of the budget is going to have to be used for financial aid. Um, and then at the same time, community members in general tend to see the financial aid office sometimes as the only place that allows the institution to create a more equitable learning experience for students from different financial backgrounds. So on the one hand, aid professionals are expected to um, you know, manage the budget or be able to predict the budget in a way that's really essential to budgeting for the college. And on the other hand, they're also expected you know, to, to be generous and to provide um, opportunities and equity for those students who, who don't have enough. And all of these things um, can make then an aid office very reluctant to appear to promise any amount of financial aid before they have a full financial aid application in front of them in order to be able to make that assessment. And then that's what leads to this, this um, what can be from the profession, um, a bit of reluctance in some ways to provide more pricing clarity for individual prospective families. To not have spent the budget, to, to, um, to not spend perhaps too much of the budget or spend it in a way that doesn't help the institution meet its needs. Um, or also, um, or this pressure to be able to give students who need it so they don't end up, you know, being, you know, the student who's not able to go to college because, because they can't afford to go. And so it makes it, and then also trying to spend that money equitably. So that, uh, unfortunately, right, the rare instance where it appears as if a family who perhaps didn't need as much aid as they received, received too much aid, right? So all of these things are competing pressures on financial aid professionals that I think encourage a level of, um, you know, of um, kind of reluctance to provide more clarity earlier in the funnel, in the admission funnel or the financial aid funnel. Um, I, and, and certainly in my early career, that was almost an expectation, right? Um, to, to kind of create, uh, you know, to not provide too, information, too much information early on so that, um, so that the institution could manage that aid budget or provide the most equitable distribution of aid, um, you know, in a, in a way that met the, the institution's goals. And families pretty much tolerated that. Um, you know, I'm a Gen Xer. My, my father is from the, what they call the silent generation, you know, kind of come out, came of age around the Korean War. I remember, we, I received financial aid, a hefty amount of financial aid to go to college. My father would have never called the financial aid office, right, to ask a question. Um, and and that, was, that was just not the way things were done, we trusted institutions. I think the press, the things that are changing now, right, is that in college, we, in the prospective student pipeline and also in our current college students, we're dealing with Generation Z. And in a few years, in about four years, the, the, the next generation, which right now has been uh, named Generation Alpha, um, will be um, applying, to, starting to apply and consider college. Um, and uh, these students, right, Gen Z, they're born between 1995 to 2010, Generation Alpha, 2010 to 2025. Um, but their parents are Gen Xers, like me, or millennials. And their parents have a very different experience um, with financing and borrowing for college than previous generations had, right? My father never graduated from college, but he um, did attend college and he pretty much worked his way through a few years and then ultimately had to leave. But he could have done it had some other things not happened in his life. And of course, for me as a Gen Xer, I remember um, the first day of college, um, having people sitting out at a table offering me a credit card, right? Um, and um, this sort of fearlessness in borrowing because of an expectation that there would constantly be economic growth and there would be income, you know, uh, growth and availability. But what happened, of course, is that um, many of us experienced what, what felt like a heavy amount of college, of debt from college 
um, even if it wasn't a heavy amount as compared to previous generations, because the cost of other things were so much. It was so much harder to afford a home. It was so much harder to even move to a city, a big city for a new job, right? Um, and so that, that really sort of created in today's parents, I think a heightened set of concern for, um, for children a college debt. The expectation, of course, now that um, students might go on to graduate school, which might lead to more debt. And so those parents and those ch and their children also trust institutions less. And many of them, not all of them, but many of them have a greater sense of agency, especially among the middle and higher income families. Um, when they uh, engage with college admission and, and aid processes and offices. Um, and they also have higher expectations and higher demands. And so I think for our future, that price transparency um, is, is, there's a greater need and expectation for it. Um, and then finally, um, the increased level of selectivity um, really has sort of heightened that need to understand for this generation of students and their families to understand um, the price much more um, ahead of time and earlier. And that's because they may apply earlier through early application programs, right? Um, and um, and it's, it, they have to be more strategic if that's the case in where they apply. Um, and so I think that families will demand a better understanding of pricing so that they can build a college list in a more strategic and a more responsible way. Terrific. Thank you so much, Joy. Um, I'm sure people would like to hear you go on even more about that as they design their uh, goals for their own children. Um, but it's also the case that uh, although financial uh, issues loom large, they are not the only barriers to college. Um, and so Lindsay, who is, uh, again, the Annenberg Associate Professor of Education Policy at Brown University, is going to talk to us a little bit about her work and the issues uh, around uh, other issues around college access. Access. Kristen, thanks so much. And I similarly um, loved hearing from Phil and loved hearing from Joy. Joy, congratulations on your um, upcoming job transition. That's very exciting. Um, so it, I think I think a great place to um, return to is something that, that Phil reminded us at the beginning, that there are all of these organizations um, that are focused on issues of college access and success. And um, what that is a, a signal of is that um, the college process overall is enormously complex. Um, I think another important thing to remember is it's an enormously complex process that students and their families go through sort of a handful of times uh, at most. And so um, it's a multifaceted process. Often we engage in it over a, a many months uh, a period of time. Um, and because of the complexity and the many steps, there's just lots and lots of room for error um, or for families to, to take a turn that um, wouldn't necessarily be considered optimal. I think another um, uh, problem that all of those nonprofit organizations um, are a symptom of is the fact that um, schools, our public schools, are often understaffed. Um, when it comes to providing students um, with adequate or excellent uh, counseling through these processes. There are plenty of um, for-profit organizations in um, the greater Boston area where families might spend $40,000 just to hire somebody to, to counsel their student through the college going process. And so as we think about equity in our college going process, um, that sort of range of supports and opportunities is something that we should also be, be keeping an eye on. Um, so I know that this, this bleeds a little bit into, um, you know, what I would, what, what my uh, sort of, where I would hang my hat from a policy recommendation standpoint. Um, but, you know, one thing that I really want to underscore um, is the idea of better investment in school counselors, making sure that we have adequate student to counselor ratios in our public schools, and better training for school counselors on all of these different topics. School counselors may not be entering into their counseling roles um, with expertise, again, in this, in this very um, complex college-going landscape. 
Um, in terms of other steps in the college going process, of course, we are um, right now living through a, a process um, hastened by COVID of uh, dramatic changes, I think, in the college admissions, um, uh, the, the requirements of college admissions. Um, one, one big change that COVID has brought is many institutions moving at least temporarily, if not permanently, to a test optional system in um, college admissions testing. Um, one thing that I've heard um, sort of anecdotally um, thinking about those kinds of nonprofit organizations that, that Phil highlighted at the beginning is many of those organizations that work with uh, students from low income backgrounds, students who may be the first in their family to go to um, college, um, they're moving fairly quickly towards telling students just not to take the SAT or ACT at all. Um, and I think that um, institutions, um, even if institutions are going test optional, I would want to see them um, be really clear with students in communicating what the benefits might still be of taking an SAT or taking an ACT, especially if those are um, if those continue to be used as gateways for providing things like merit-based financial aid. We want to make sure that students aren't skipping steps in processes and um, missing out on, on financial benefits as a result. Um, so that's something that is, is top of mind for me. Um, one other um, thing that uh, Joy mentioned that I just want to highlight um, is, you know, in, in college going in general, another um, step that's really important for students to get right is, is just the question of where to apply, what institution is going to be a good fit for them um, uh, overall, in addition to the, the financial components of things, um, and really asking the question of, um, do the institutions that I'm applying to, or, 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 you know, do the institutions that are recruiting me as a student, do they have my best interest in mind? And um, especially for institutions, not exclusively, but especially for institutions that are um, sitting in the for-profit sector, um, I think that that's something that we should worry about, that we should help students understand um, uh, those, those kinds of um, motivations for institutions. Um, so I think I will um, wrap it up there. I'm just keeping an eye on the time. Um, I think all of us could go on and on and on um, on, on many different dimensions, um, but I'm eager to hear what Sandy has to say. All right, thank you so much for that. Um, I'll just remind people that this is all happening against the backdrop of increasing inequality. And we always hold out college as something that has the promise of addressing some of those economic mobility gaps. So let's turn it over to Sandy, um, whose forthcoming book, um, Can College Level the Playing Field, Higher Education and Unequal Society, uh, has something to say about that. Thank you. Um, and I have uh, listening to everyone else talk, I feel like so much has already been said, it's not that easy um, to come up with new things. But um, I and I thank you for mentioning my book, which is coming out next week. Phil and I are very excited that our books are coming out at about the same time, because we think that the issues complement each other very well. Um, let me just say, I, I think it's really important to think about the two types of issues that Phil has raised both the price itself, the affordability, the dollars and cents part of it, and the complexity, because um, you know they're very interrelated. There is a trade-off sometimes between them. As Phil mentioned, if you lower your sticker price, for example, uh, and try to be simpler, if you, if you try to be simple and not charge everybody a different price, you wouldn't be able to give the need-based financial aid on which the low and moderate income students um, depend. So you, you can't really separate uh, these two issues. And I could talk about the affordability issue forever. Um, the one thing that I want to say is that many of the numbers that Phil put out there are really the comprehensive fee, tuition fees, room board, student budget. And of course, a lot of, of students don't live on a college campus. Colleges don't really have anything to do with local rents and food prices. And that has a lot to do with what, how students struggle in financing their college education. And <clears throat> I think that's really important if we think, for example, about suggestions like, well, just make college free. People really mean make tuition free, mostly at public colleges. And there's gonna be a lot left over to talk about in terms of, of affordability. But really I wanna focus more 
um, the problems that are not the dollars and cents that students have in their pockets when they uh, enroll in college, and even on the other complexities uh, that Lindsay raised about other problems that students face. And take a step back and along the lines of, of my book that's coming out next week that I know everyone will read, um, uh, what we try to do, and I co-authored this with Mike McPherson, is put college into the context of the life cycle, that higher education is one stage of many stages throughout your life. And if we really want to understand how to create better college opportunities for students, we have to look at what's happening to them earlier in their lives. So, you know, some kids and most of the kids, unfortunately, who end up at the Wellesleys and the Harvards of the world grow up in comfortable neighborhoods, safe neighborhoods, comfortable houses, they have good health care, they have good early childhood education, their parents shower opportunities on them and, you know, educational trips and toys and so on. And they can get ready to go to college. But a lot of other kids are growing up in unsafe neighborhoods. They're moving frequently from one substandard uh, housing unit to another. They are lucky if they get three meals a day. Their parents have great difficulty, um, you know, making ends meet, providing any of the opportunities that, that other children in more affluent um, and privileged and not first generation communities have. And these kids, you know, they fend for themselves a lot. They have incredibly high stress levels. So it's not just they turn 16 and we need to make sure they have the information about college and we need to, need to make sure they have the financial aid to pay for college. We do need to make sure about those things and I don't want to downplay their importance. But I think, you know, it's not surprising that you have all these high school students who are not going to, you know, the website and looking up the college calculator and trying to figure it out. They don't understand that it matters where they go to college. They've had very little contact with people who are college graduates other than, you know, their teachers. And so it, it really is um, a, a serious problem that we can't solve at the door to college and that colleges and universities can help with, but they can't solve it themselves. And so I guess the, the main message that I would like to give is for people, most of the people listening to this are people who are tuned in very much to the higher education world, and they are likely to lobby for things like higher Pell Grants, things that um, uh, Phil has raised and that Lindsay has raised. But I think that the, those of us who are focused on that world really have to do a good job of also lobbying for early childhood education, for better access to health care, for child tax credits. We have to understand that, you know, minimum wages and and uh, worker autonomy and income tax progressivity all contribute to how families live and to how children grow up and to the extent to which the next generation will be prepared for college and therefore prepared to take advantage of the kinds of policies on which higher education advocates focus. So we do need to double the Pell Grant. I'm a little skeptical of Phil's solution of uh, just require that, that schools meet all need in order to take care of that. And we do need to simplify and we do need to focus on all those things um, that Joy and, and Lindsay have talked about. But I really think we need to put at the top of our agenda how we tackle other issues of inequality, how we make sure that the next generation grows up with less inequality at the time they come to the door of college so that they can take advantage of the kinds of opportunities we're talking about. It's actually easier to think of solutions to the, the seemingly intractable college financing problems than it is to find solutions to the bigger problems that create such disparities in how people can deal with those problems when it's time for them to do that. So I just think that, you know, it's not like I'm saying take money away from the Pell Grant to do other things, but I do think that thinking that we can find the sole solution there is wrong and that the power of the voices of people in higher education and of the people who are educating people at colleges and universities um, can only be fully used if we expand our horizons and really, really think about our task of increasing post-secondary educational opportunities as requiring a much broader public policy focus. So now we can all talk together.
Thank you so much for that. Um, so let's uh, bring Phil back into this uh, conversation. And um, let me just start off about uh, talking about some of the buzzwords that are sort of out there, the policies that are floating by people like free college, canceling college debt, uh, you know, uh, those issues. And, you know, as Sandy just uh, reminded us, free college is uh, an interesting idea. But if there are people who have not been advantaged enough to be able to go to college at all. It's not going to hurt. It's not going to help them at all. Right. And so, um, Phil, do you just want to maybe talk a little bit about free college in the context of all of this, uh, inequality that we see? Sure. Uh, yeah. So I, uh, I'm grateful to the comments they all, that everybody else just made, cause I pretty much agree with every single one of them. <laughs> um, but, uh, in terms of free college, I think it's important to think about from within the narrower focus of higher education, comparing free college to doubling the Pell Grant, you know, I see uh, doubling the Pell Grant is a, is a much more desirable solution. Um, you know, it is providing exactly the right amount of money to exactly the students who face the greatest difficulties in affording a college education. Um, I think that um, free college has issues of uh, targeting, so it's not clear. You know, there's discussions about you know limiting this, the scope uh, to different income levels, but those typical in income levels are often much higher than the Pell Grant threshold. Um, there's issues about you know, as Sandy mentioned, whether this is just tuition that gets included, whether that's on top of other forms of financial aid or instead of other forms of financial aid. That's a problem. Um, you know, I think to the extent that we have any concern for the system of uh, uh, private higher education, uh, you know, Harvard will survive within a free college world, but, you know, less well endowed institutions, which would not be eligible for, for the free college subsidies, uh, would be significantly disadvantaged. Um, many of whom I would imagine to the, you know, to the point of life threateningly disadvantaged. Um, if, you know, there are $15,000 subsidies to go to a public institution that they weren't eligible for, um, you know, I sort of think that greater choice is a good thing uh, and that that would be a problem. Uh, so, you know, for all of those reasons, I, you know, I would much more strongly support doubling the Pell Grant than free college. Anybody have anything else to add to that? I would like to add that for me, one of the key questions is that people are talking about free without saying what it is that's free and a policy that directs resources towards the promise of zero tuition and doesn't focus enough resources on how the institutions are going to provide educational opportunities. Community colleges, broad access public institutions are underfunded. And we, it, there's no point in making it free for people if the institutions are not equipped to provide the opportunities those students need to succeed. Thanks. Oh, Lindsay, you're nodding along. You want to take up that thread or uh, change change our focus a little bit? No, no, I I I'm just nodding in in agreement. So it's fine to move on. I think. Okay. So, um, Joy, can you uh, going back to sort of what's actually going on in people's lives? Can you talk about how people pay for college? And in particular, I'm thinking about things like the Parent Plus loans that people might hear about. What what are those? Who pays them? How are they? Who takes them out? How do they get used? Right, so um, I can certainly talk about the plus loans in the context of um, wealthy at least. And um, uh, parents are eligible for plus loans to cover um, basically the cost of attendance minus whatever aid for which they're eligible for. Um, and um, these loans are based not on a family's um, income to debt ratio, but really on their credit score. Um, and um, they are a really helpful tool for some families, but we certainly see it even at a place like Wellesley, where it seems as if, um, you know, some families who in some ways have, are already struggling in um, the financial aid process seem to be taking on even further burden. Um, and in particular, Phil knows this, um, what we were noticing is a trend of seeing um, applicants for later children and recognizing that parents had taken on so much 
uh, so much parent loan debt for earlier children that they were literally in a place where they couldn't take on um, any more debt. Um, and so, um, you know, we often see, for instance, that um, uh, Black parents are much more likely to take out uh, parent plus loans in order to cover their parent contribution, um, even middle income or higher income um, parents, many times because they have less generational wealth or generational other generation um, generations contributing. Um, we also see that um, uh, divorced parents where both parents, are, that we have an expectation in our needs analysis that both parents um, will contribute to a student's college education, but there's nothing usually legally binding an, um, a, a either parent to contribute. And sometimes you have a non-custodial parent with resources. And so there's an expectation that, that the family is paying more, but the other parent won't contribute. And so the custodial parent, for instance, maybe takes on much more debt than he or she can um, effectively manage. So for families who can, uh, who can afford it and plan for it and really kind of have the, the wealth resources to support it, um, they're an important opportunity. And they, you know, some students definitely could not go to even a place like Wellesley without them. Um, but I think that the long-term implications um, for parent loans and for future generations is, is it's, it's questionable to me how sustainable it is. So I know you know more than anyone I know, besides Joy, about the nitty gritty of how uh, the financial aid process uh, plays out in people's lives. Do you want to talk a little bit about how different kinds of assets count and what the ramifications might that might be for families with different kinds of wealth holdings? Yeah, so uh, you know, I think one of the interesting things that, that Joy and I have talked about is that uh, Joy actually... Um, uh, started a research project for me, or motivated a research project for me, having a discussion almost exactly like this one, um, looking at the at racial gaps in parental plus loans. Uh, that's something that, you know, Joy mentioned she sees at Wellesley, but also you see nationwide and sort of uh, broader level data that parent plus loans are much more common and much larger uh, among black students and their families. Uh, particularly among those in the sort of the higher EFC categories. I mean, um, this is not so much a problem for the lower income families. They don't have any assets. They don't, they don't, they're not expected to pay as much uh, in the first place, but in the, you know, middle, upper middle class, uh, you know, levels of socioeconomic status, you know, you see a lot of it and the racial gap is very large and, and uh, you know, one potential explanation for that, that I think this research project that Joy is motivated seems to support uh, is that that has a lot to do with the structure of the financial aid system. So the financial aid system, you know, one thing that we know about the world is that there's just tremendous wealth gaps uh, by race. Uh, and the problem with that in the financial aid system is that, you know, we count some forms of assets, but it actually turns out to be the case that most forms of assets we don't count. So, you know, in the, in the, for schools that use FAFSA, we don't include home equity and we don't include uh, retirement savings. Well, that's most people's retirement, that's most people's wealth. Uh, if you ignore that, and we have this world in which, you know, white families are much more likely to have those resources and in much larger amounts, uh, if we don't count them, that sort of provides them with a little inside advantage. Um, almost like an implicit subsidy to going to college that you know they can take advantage of the black students can uh, that seems like a fact that's in the data it seems like it's related to differences in you know academic progress among uh, racial uh, racial groups in terms of the likelihood of going to college uh, graduating from college and other sort of higher educational outcomes it's definitely something we need to pursue a little bit further and that's what the, yeah ongoing research Thanks uh, for that. Uh, Lindsay, I was hoping you would just remind us, first of all, why you think it's important to uh, help students go to college. Like what, you know, this, sometimes this discussion gets uh, the, the question of like, is it worth it gets uh, lost, right? And then besides the financial aid stuff, are there other things that you think we could be doing to um, improve college access? 
Yeah, um, we could oh, we could we could be here all day for for that kind of conversation. You know, in in a lot of the work um, that I have done, and I want to um, you know give um, credit to my um, good friend and colleague Ben Castleman in this work. Um, we have been focused on um, you know identifying students who at the end of high school um, have um, well articulated plans to go on to college. And even for, for students who get to the end of high school with plans to go to college, they have applied for college, been accepted, applied for financial aid, done all of the kinds of steps that we're talking about. Um, even, even for students who have um, these well-organized plans, um, what we see is particularly for students from low-income backgrounds, um, many of those students aren't successfully making the transition to college. So in, in a way, uh, because of all of the complexity in the processes that students still need to navigate in that summer period of time, um, where they have to be dealing with things like unmet financial need, um, with all of the paperwork that um, goes on with the transition to college, so on and so forth. Um, so in a way, um, that body of work sort of sidesteps the question of should, should students be going to college? There, we're just looking at students who have already made that decision for themselves. And even for that group, um, they, are, they are not successfully making the transition. Um, you know, should, should students be going to college? I think the, you know, broad strokes economics uh, work in, we're in, in economics and, and Phil and Sandy, I'm sure could um, talk about this as well. Um, we still see positive returns to, um, to going to college, both in terms of lifetime earnings, um, but also in terms of things like um, whether, whether people are married later in life and living in stable household circumstances. Um, what their health is, what their longevity is, um, whether or not they're, they're relying on, on various public benefits. And so um, I, think it's, I think it's important for us to think about the, the questions of college going, um, not only in terms of the private returns to the individual or the family, but really the, you know, we should keep talking about the important social returns to um, having a, a well-educated um, highly educated populace. So, so do I think college is the end all be all for every, every person? No, I, I don't necessarily subscribe to, to that notion. Um, but I, I think we, we do need to continue to have a um, public policy commitment to making sure that college is accessible to um, every student who um, wants to go. And, and um, we also have to help um, students and families to continue to understand why going to college is a, is a, a good pathway. All right, thank you so much. Uh, as usual, uh, my interest is, is big and our time is short. So um, we're gonna have to, uh, we're gonna have to move along. I'm gonna ask our panelists and, our, and, and Phil to kick us off here. And just if you have one fact that you'd like us to remember after this webinar ends, and if there's one policy you'd like to suggest, and then um, I'll thank people for coming. So Phil, go ahead. Okay, I, well, I think I've, um provided a lot of detail on that already. So my, my one fact is that college affordability is a problem, particularly for lower income students. Um, and doubling the Pell Grant is the right solution to that problem. Joy? So I'll do them in rever reverse. Um, you know, this is not necessarily the top priority for a place like Wellesley or for Harvard, but I agree with Phil that doubling Pell um, is uh, to me the most important important policy um, decision to helping students um, across many income categories. Um, I just think one fact to sort of keep in mind, um, just to be able to appreciate that every policy creates incentives for institutions um, and just to remember what kind of incentives are we creating um, when we um, pass different policies or um, you know do things to prioritize some factors in college education over others. Thanks. Lindsay? Sure, thank you. Um, so I think um, in the spirit of thinking about college going, the, the fact that I would wanna offer is many high schools in the country um, have student to school counselor ratios that are way, way, way beyond um, what um, would be recommended from a public policy standpoint. Um, and um, that um, we should advocate for uh, better resources to make sure that students are getting um, appropriate and, and free access to um, strong college counseling. Terrific. 
Sandy Bell? So I guess I'm going to say um, let's not focus on the sticker price of college as the source of the issues. And then that encompasses all the other problems we've talked about that are barriers. And in order to address the barriers of future college students, the solution is not to forgive all outstanding student debt, which doesn't help future college students. It's instead to double pell and put resources into other things that will help students prepare for and enroll and succeed in college. Thank you so much. Well, with that, I'd really like to thank our panelists, um, Phil Levine, Joyce St. John, Lindsay Page, and Sandy Baum. I think we could um, talk about this uh, for many, many more hours. Uh, I hope uh, people who are watching um, got some information, but are left with a sense of curiosity. And if you are, I could recommend two books for you. One is A Problem of Fit by Phil Levine, and one is um, Sandy Baum's book on um, college, uh, can college level the playing field that's out next week. So uh, thank you all for joining and um, have a nice rest of your afternoon. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.